Right. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me and for, well, allowing me to speak on something that I deeply care about. Uh, my talk is called Trust and Ethics at the Workplace. And this topic or the conjunction of these two topics is rarely discussed at work. Usually it's some research from moral philosophy or something else. So I think we lack some understanding of what trust and ethic means and why it's important to have it at the workplace. So I'm Vitaly. Uh, I have more than 22 years of experience in IT. I started when I was 17. I did some system administration. Then I did 13 years of JavaScript development. I started with IE 5.5 and Opera 7.5, which was a nightmare, I must admit. Uh, then I shifted to engineering management, and I now still teach engineering managers and CTOs, and I consult companies on various process issues, etc. I also write articles. I am now a developer advocate at Case.io. My company does quite a decent test management system. And I love cats and dogs. I've been always loving them. They are just my <laughs> true friends. So I want to start this talk with a short video. Just listen carefully. So in this video, oops, let me hit play once again. On this video, you've heard some squeaky noises and essentially what this is is there is a um, couple of types of ground squirrels which have very particular and peculiar behavior <clears throat> they have sentry roles so it's like they have shifts <laughs> when some squirrel picks a sentry role and she starts looking for predators, for owls and other predators who hunt those squirrels. And as soon as she, it's always her, as soon as she hears or sees the predator, she starts screaming, as you've heard. So she alarms everyone, essentially exposing herself to more danger because the predator will not only see her, but the predator will also hear her and attack her. So this looks like a very altruistic, if, no, if not kamikaze-style behavior, where one particular squirrel just shows very strange behavior, alarming everyone so that they can hide from the predator and exposing her to more danger. And there was a great scientist by the surname of Hamilton, and in 1964, he wrote a book called Genetical Evolution of Social Behavior, where he explained um, why in many, many um, species there is this trait of behavior where a certain um, act is done on altruistic ground. And essentially it's very simple. If this squirrel doesn't alarm everyone, then chances are that the whole pack, the whole group will die just because the predator will spot them all. And owls don't hunt in just one go. They hunt till they are uh, well fed. So if that squirrel doesn't have trust that other squirrels will do the same reciprocally, reciprocally then mm, the whole pack would die. And yes, by the way, on every slide, I have a QR code linking to some article or study or research mm, related to what I'm talking about. Also, uh, another good example of this interesting collaborative behavior which involves trust is wolves when they hunt. Because uh, some of the wolves, they have to distract uh, the prey and some other wolves would then bite the legs of the prey to immobilize it and to then kill it and eat it. So those dogs, so those wolves uh, which are behind the prey, they are trusting others to distract the prey. If they didn't trust those who are in the front of the bison, then they would be just killed by the bison. So essentially, some of the wolves are just showing some altruistic behavior, and some of the wolves are relying on that altruistic behavior. In our species, in Homo sapiens, uh, one or two million years ago was a very interesting shift in 
our evolution, where we started trusting each other even more. So trust does facilitate cooperation. As soon as we started to specialize so that there is a group of people who hunt, there is a group of people who cook, there is a group of people or one or two people who um, craft some tools, we had more success in evolution. And this allowed us to have so-called non-genetic evolution. So we started evolving as social species. And it's not only some coincidental behavior found in some species. Actually, there is a very sound math theory explaining why trust and collaborative behavior is beneficial in some cases. And the main cases, the main case for this is so-called non-zero-sum game. There is a zero-sum game where we compete, let's say you and I compete for a limited resource. And I want to take more of it and you want to take more of it. And then there is non-zero-sum game, such as, let's say, teamwork, where you and I, working together, collaborating together, produce more than we could produce if we worked individually. And also, companies investing money in our salaries, they are playing the same non-zero-sum game, because more they invest, more people they hire with normal processes, with proper processes, more money the company gets. Or if we talk about the team, if I invest in teaching someone on the team or in sharing knowledge or in helping someone on the team, this brings more value to everyone because the team is now more experienced. The team on the whole has more knowledge now and so that the team can produce more result. And then if the company is well managed, we can get more money or maybe, and our customers will be happier. So what is trust? Uh, there are multiple definitions of trust. And what's funny is that pretty much every job listing I've seen has uh, somewhere be between the lines, they have something like, we have a trustworthy team, or we work in a trusting environment, or we trust each other. But it's very sad to see that it seems none of those managers or HRs or recruiters who composed those job descriptions actually understand what trust is. Because according to a couple of definitions I've put here, uh, they are from different areas of uh, social psychology or whatever. Mm, trust is, well, first thing, trust is a willingness of the truster to become vulnerable to the trustee on the presumption that the trustee will act in ways that benefit the truster as we've seen with squirrels. If a squirrel picks a sentry role in a shift, then she trusts that her dangerous to her behavior would do good to the whole pack and that others would do the same reciprocally. So in addition, according to the definition, the truster does not have control over the actions of the trustee. That, that squirrel could not enforce others to behave in a similar way she did. She just trusted them. Another definition is that individual trusts if she voluntarily places resources at the disposal of another party without any legal commitment from the latter. So if I spend a few hours teaching some member of my team, I'm putting a few hours of my time, billable time, into that person to help that person. And I have no legal commitment from that person that she or he would return me those hours. So yeah, it's just an act of trust. It's a leap of faith that I do something altruistically, um, wanting the whole team, the whole group to become better. So why am I talking about trust at work? Well, there is plenty of study and research almost proving that effective teamwork yields greater results for all parties involved. So if I'm a part, if I'm a member of an effective team, I am happier, I am more performant, I learn better and faster, and the whole team works better. And this effective teamwork demands trust. All these studies I've, I've read, and it's a few books, like five books or six books on trust and evolution of trust in teams and 
nature and everywhere. And all the studies and research I've read, more than 40 research papers, they all say that effective teamwork has proper collaboration and proper collaboration demands trust. If I can't trust my team member to help me, our collaboration will not be good. So as ground squirrels altruistically alert others, teammates collaborate by altruistically sharing knowledge and helping each other. This is essential for effective teamwork. I highly recommend you read this QR code or some books on trust in teams. And what's very interesting and very important here, according to the definition, trust means no control. So if you see or if you work in a company where you have KPIs, OKRs, metrics, grades, time tracking tools, individual performance reviews, or some process decisions imposed on your teams, like someone tells you, you now need to work in Scrum, or now you are switching to Kanban, or now you are doing project management, whatever. This means that you are being controlled by all these tools. And this means that management doesn't trust in you. And, or let's say if you have code reviews, asynchronous code reviews, that means that your team members do not trust you and management do not trust you. So trust means allowing and nurturing autonomy. And what's very peculiar here is that according to Daniel Pink, and he actually wrote his book based on the whole bunch of psychological research and the consensus of psychological scientists, they all say that autonomy is one of the strongest motivators. So first, if you have trust, you will not control people. And if you do not control people, they will be more autonomous and the teams will be more autonomous and they will be much more motivated. This QR code, if I remember correctly, links to so-called control aversion study. There is actually very good scientific proof that whenever you control people, they show less results. So if my CEO told me, Vitaly, I need 10 articles per month, I would produce, even knowing this law, psychological law, I would still produce less than compared to the case when he tells me, Vitaly, produce as many articles as you can, I trust you. I trust you to do a good job. So autonomy is one of the strongest motivators and this is not just psychological studies. Uh, there is a very interesting Gallup research saying that broken trust, when people understand and feel that they are not trusted at the workplace, this causes disengagement. And Gallup states that disengaged employees cost 7.8 trillion in lost productivity in the world, and it is equal to 11% of global GDP. So the issue of lack of trust is so significant that one-tenth of the global GDP is lost just due to this condition. And whenever I tell people anything about trust and I tell them that in order to trust, you have to show your vulnerability and exercise no control over your employees or colleagues, People always say, well, how do I even do that? Because trust, to start trusting is to have this leap of faith. I, being a manager, need to start trusting my developers or my employees. And then, potentially, they will do the same to me, potentially. So the question is, what to do with free riders? In game theory, there is this concept of a free rider, someone who lives in a society or in a team or in a group, and that person doesn't trust anyone, doesn't play along the ethical rules of the team, and he becomes or she becomes toxic because others, when they see that someone is not playing fair, they will start playing not fair too. The question of free riders is huge and there is no proper answer in politic science, political science and in sociology. There is still no proper answer what to do with them and how to, design, how to design such a team 
where there will be no free riders or how to design such a society where there will be no free riders? Mm, I think it's currently impossible to answer that. But, so this, this raises a huge question. Should I start with trust? Should I trust people? How do I do that? Knowing that trust is so essential for team performance and for people motivation, what can we do about it? And I think that the answer is um, to have some professional ethics. So when we come to a doctor, we trust that person. Why does, what, why does it happen? Why do we trust doctors? I would even say that um, we perceive hospitals or doctors sometimes like some sacred place where some sacred knowledge and good people work and do stuff and help us. Help us. So I would say my hypothesis is that we trust doctors not only because we know they, are, they have diplomas and they are well, well certified, but also that we know or at least feel that they have these ethics, that they will help people anyway. And a few millennia ago, doctors started having this Hippocratic Oath. In Latin, it's, it's pronounced as primum non nocere. And in plain English, it's, I will use those regimens which will benefit my patients according to my greatest ability and judgment, and I will do no harm or injustice to them. Neither I will administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. So we kind of feel that when we come to a doctor and tell them that there's some headache, that I have some headache, we trust that the doctor will not just chop a head off or do something crazy, um, but the doctor would, would actually diagnose the problem. The doctor would actually try to figure out, according to his knowledge and abilities, what, what the reason for this headache is and what proper treatment to administer to cater for that reason, to, to stop this headache and to cure the disease. And essentially ethics is just principles that govern behavior. So as, as, I, as I've shown with medical ethics, main principle there is do no harm and do some good. And what happens in engineering? So like in, med in medicine, it's very simple. What the doctor says, they say, I am a specialist. My goal here is to solve problems. My knowledge helps me diagnose the problem. I will do what's right, even if the client wants what's wrong. So if you come to a doctor and tell them, cut my leg off, they will not do that for sure. They will try to understand, maybe you need a psychiatrist now, or maybe you actually are in, in, in pain and you need some treatment to your leg, but they will never do what you ask. They will actually do what's needed for you because they know better what's happening. And in engineering, I rarely see some eth ethics. First reason for that, I think, is that we have no tradition, no proper tradition. Medicine and medical ethics is a few millennia old. And engineering, it only started with pyramids, I think, and it wasn't that well-defined with ethics and everything. Um, we, we still have this disagree but commit whenever a manager tells us, um, ship this code, even if it's bad, let's cut the corners and we'll figure it out later. We still do that. We still, we still don't say things like the doctors would say, I would not administer the drug to you. We still have a huge problem of imposter syndrome. I'm not sure if doctors have imposter syndrome at all, but I know that pretty much every developer, every programmer has imposter syndrome where we do not understand if we actually are good enough to decide what to do. To say, I will not do this whiteboarding, whiteboard uh, coding exercise at, on, at the interview, or uh, I will not ship code with a pass, or I will not shift to Scrum because I don't think it's good enough for me, or things like that. We also have system issues in our team. We have performance reviews, which are seriously detrimental to every company. And they dissolve teams and they just, just, dis the teams disappear. We have groups now, groups of individuals competing for bonuses. We have grades where managers grade us, where managers decide who is better. 
And we have lots of cargo cult and irrationality. We copy technologies from other companies, thinking that if other companies mm, succeeded, that might be because they had those technologies. Well, actually, no. Or we copy processes, or we copy Spotify model, <laughs> or we copy some other models from different companies, or we copy Google interviews to our small startups, thinking that if Google is so successful, maybe we could do the same. So we work irrationally. Rather than have a medical science, we abandon engineering science. We just work as coders most of the time. So that's, I think that's the reason why engineering ethics is so rarely seen. And why am I talking about ethics? So first thing, as I told you, trust brings better teamwork. Ethics, I think, is the first step to allow yourself to start trusting people. Because imagine we have this situation in Google with layoffs or in any other big company with layoffs. So a company decides to cut 6% of staff. Imagine what would happen if 94 remaining percent of staff said, well, you know what, dear management, if you cut, if you lay off those people, we will quit too. If those 94% had ethics, would that be better for the market? I think it would be better for the market because that would stop overhiring. Or if you're working on a team and your manager tells you, uh, you need to ship that bad quality feature now and we will work with tech debt, um, let's say in a month or two, you know the customers will be struggling with that code. You know with, this, with that feature. You know the team would be struggling with maintaining that feature. You know that the manager does not have enough information and knowledge at least on a total cost of ownership model of calculating how much money maintaining that code would take and would spend. So you know the manager is telling you to do the bad stuff, and yet you do it. But what would happen if you and your team had ethics? What would happen if you followed, let's say, medical ethics code, medical ethical code? If you would say, well, dear manager, you know what? you are going to harm yourself, the company, and the customers. So then we are not doing what you demand. What would happen then? Would that be better for you, for the team, for the company, and for the customers? It's for you to decide. But I think that ethics help people act morally and professionally better. If you have this strong ethics, you can then think that, like, you can then align with others, with people on your team. So ethics could help you and your team to be better. And ethics help live a happier life if you're proud of your work. And actually, folks, we work more time, more hours a day than we spend with our families. I think it's very important to live a happy life at work too. And if you're proud at your, with your work, if you're proud with what and how you're doing, I think you'd be happier. And on this QR code, you can see a research proving that happy developers are more productive. So you see, you see how it's all linked together. If you start trusting people, you have better collaboration and more performance. If you start trusting people, you live a happier life because you know people will help you. But trusting people is hard. So if you develop your own ethical code and align it with others, it would be easier for you to rely on others to trust you too. <clears throat> and that would yield you a happier life. It's very hard to start with developing your ethical code. So if you believe in God, there is Bible for you. There is evangelistic imperative. If you don't, you can follow Kant's categorical imperative where... I think it's quite simple. Um, you behave in a way that you want to be a universal law across your team and company. Uh, I usually simplify it to my mom's categorical imperative, I call it. I behave in a way that I would want my mom to be treated everywhere. So I do not 
um, I do not argue with a taxi driver in rude words because I don't want my mom to be argued like that. Um, it's very simple, I think. But I would suggest that everyone should develop their own ethical code, develop some principles guiding the behavior at work, and then try to align those principles with others and influence others, lead them by example. If people see, if your teammates see that you object to harmful things imposed by colleagues or managers or asked by colleagues and managers, chances are other people would at least consider objecting too. <clears throat> and if you are a senior developer at your company, imagine what would happen if junior developers who just joined your team saw you objecting to crazy stuff, saw you, saw you doing the right thing, they would be impressed by that. And they would learn that things like that can happen and that you can demand others to treat the team well and treat the colleagues well and treat the customers well. I think... That's it. Mm, there is my Twitter, Telegram, email, GitHub, and blog. I would love to have a discussion about this topic. If anyone has questions or anything to comment, please feel free. All right. Thank you, Vitaly. That was great. Um, Thank you. Like I said before, I think this is a, a topic we, we don't talk about. It's often kind of difficult mm -hmm. to talk about, to be quite honest. Like, like, you know, I shared an experience in the chat um, and I know it's difficult sometimes to sh even share some of the experiences of yeah. dealing with this because, um, you know, there, there might, there's always fear of repercussions, right? Yes. So, yeah. um, but I can say from my own personal experience, multiple jobs, but even like a mm -hmm. more recent, not my current job, but more recent experience mm -hmm. um, where a lack of trust caused you know, uh, basically people like we weren't we, not just not productive, but we, mm -hmm. people wouldn't share mm -hmm. critical, like critical feedback because, oh, yeah. Yeah. because yeah. they, they seen others get basically ripped apart for sharing that. Yeah. And so nobody shared it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the product and, and everything, not just our morale suffered, but the output suffered because yeah. We weren't we weren't facing critical like the critical mm -hmm. decisions we needed mm -hmm. to make because mm -hmm. you know nobody could share that feedback. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, that's just my long way of saying like I think I think all the points you made are thank you are really are really great. Um, if anybody in the audience has any questions, I have some questions myself. Yeah. But if you're in the audience and you have questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll make sure that Vitelli um, mm -hmm. gets them. So. Actually, that that got me thinking about your autonomy and, and controlling people gives mm -hmm. you less results. And, yeah. you know, um, so outside of leaving, right, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's an, like taking that scenario yeah. I posed where yeah. Yeah. people are afraid to give critical feedback mm -hmm. that outside of just leaving the company. I mean, how do you? How would you suggest like handling yeah. that situation within uh -huh. the companies you created? Um, yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I can share my own experience first and then propose some steps for others. So I am a developer advocate. I think, and, th and before that, I was doing coaching and mentoring for engineering managers for seven years. So my <laughs> skill is influencing others and teaching others sometimes even sometimes when others those others don't want to be taught that's usually quite hard but still i want to influence even my boss so for example in my company we had a few months of one-on-ones where we were trying to agree on the let's say um, velocity of mine how much stuff i should produce I was explaining and showing and explaining and showing again that if I am controlled, I am demotivated. 
I show, I've shown multiple research on the topic. I've, I've explained how this demotivates me when I'm having my deadline coming soon. I gonna, my, I'm fortunate, I am fortunate that my CEO is a former developer and he still develops code. So he knows that when there is a deadline, quality drops. So when we were trying to agree on this velocity of mine, I told him, if we agree on that, I would have deadline every, every week. Instead, let me show you how much I can do if I have no deadlines and control. Let's run an experiment. And we ran an experiment for a couple of months and he saw how much I produce. Talks, blog posts, etc., and some code. And he was happy with that. And I told him, well, see, my dear CEO, if you are happy with that, should we actually come back to the discussion of the well, let's say KPIs. It's not KPIs, but it's velocity control. He said, well, no, it's all right. Please proceed doing what you're doing. But if you stop doing it, we will discuss it again. I said, fine. Of course, we will discuss it again. If, if I have problems, I will come and talk to you. So there is this very simple way of trying out things with no control. Ask your manager for an experiment. It's like in most companies where I see Scrum, uh, product managers quite often bring hypothesis or product hypothesis features or user stories uh, which they are not certain about which they're not sure about they tell the team it's an experiment let's have an experiment for a couple of weeks i would say the team can say the same let's have an experiment for a couple of weeks please do not control us for two or three sprints we will see how it works let's have no sprint goals let's let's just work on delivering quality stuff and you know what there is actually a good study a very interesting one I'll find a link to it. Uh, there was one team and they were arguing all the time about story points calculation. So their manager was saying, your story points are not predictable at all. Uh, your velocity is strange, etc., etc." And they told them, they, so, so the variation of the story points was very big. They did this. They removed story points estimation at all and they replaced it with the number of user stories. So they saw that within a month, they actually deliver a very mm, similar amount of user stories per month. So they stopped doing estimation in story points at all. So they stopped having this control of how much stuff are you promising to deliver by the end of your sprint. And they were much happier having shifted to this way of working. So I would say, try an experiment. If you are working with Mm, sprints and scrum try running an experiment with no sprint goal and with no rigid end of deadline end of sprint just say we're gonna have a month of work let's try if you have a good scrum master uh, they will agree i think hmm. yeah that is interesting i i'd say i was thinking about it as you spoke and i'm mm -hmm. like you know I tend to need a deadline on the mm -hmm. one hand, but I tend to be fine. I also tend to be fine setting those deadlines for myself. Mm -hmm. Like so, but so I set I set those deadlines for yourself. But, that's yeah. that's very important. Yeah. Uh, it's like with metrics as well. If I am seeing, like you know, there is this proverb that a good author who writes books has to write at least, um, let's say, a couple of kilobytes of text per day. But that's the metric they set for themselves. For themselves they need to see how much they're doing as soon as this metric escapes somewhere this control aversion mechanism kicks in as soon as we see someone demanding from us a couple of kilobytes of text per day we will produce much less it's i mean i i can say from experience that i've seen mm -hmm. that in in sense of people play to you know you always have to on the one hand i understand like the need for metrics of some yeah. sort not necessarily like metrics in terms of velocity but like mm -hmm. goals we have goals mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. team. We yeah. have goals. Mm -hmm. so and those goals have to be something i can measure otherwise how do i know if you've succeeded or not right like i have to say like we're, we're trying to you know and the good companies i've worked for these are more like trying to set ourselves some kind of target so that we know where we're headed as mm -hmm. opposed to being like hey you you were you we said you'd reach not 100 and you reach 99 you know you're punished kind of thing 
like they understood these are these are just they were more helping us have a direction as opposed to mm -hmm. some kind of hard and fast thing i mean things yeah. change as you go um you know so <laughs> but my point being you sometimes you set these goals and then you lose track of why they were set yeah and you, yeah and mm -hmm. people start just kind of adjusting the way they do things exactly. just so that they hit those metrics and yeah. not because of why we set the metrics in the first place. You are describing Goodhart law. That's Goodhart's law. Okay. Um, yeah. He was saying that there is actually a scientist, social psychologist, or I can't remember, a mathematician. He was saying that as soon as something measurable becomes a target, it ceases, it ceases to be a good metric. <clears throat> Because when you say, let's have 1 million unique users next year and on, on our website, you can lose your focus. You can acquire some crazy PR agency damaging the PR brand of your, the, the brand of your team, but actually acquiring this 1 million users. We, we just lose control of ourselves as soon as we have this set in stone some, some goal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I partially... I agree with that, but mm -hmm. a part of me also feels like, well, you have to have some goal that's measurable. If, mm -hmm. Like I said, I feel like it's a matter of how you deal with the goal, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, like we would set it as, and, you know, in, in the best teams I've worked with, this was more like, okay, let's, let's, let's see if we can achieve this, but we're not, we're not going to hire, we're not going to fire you because of, we're not going to mm -hmm. punish you. Like we're going to, you know, if we can't achieve it, like we'll adjust if there's a better metric we'll change the metric, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I would um, love to have this as a separate talk. I, I love this topic. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's a, it is an important talk. It, yeah. But I, I mean, getting back to how that relates mm -hmm. to ethics, I think, yeah, you know, um, I, I also want to, one of the other things I was I was thinking about is mm -hmm. your responsibility as an employee, I'm gonna kind of go a little bit of biographical like mm -hmm. career wise yeah i'd say early in my career you know if i saw something you know i was a little too afraid to bring it up because i was too yeah. junior mm -hmm. um and i was worried and and there was very hierarchical structures at these companies and things like that um but i always felt like from an ethical standpoint i I'd, I'd end up leaving mm -hmm. having yeah. said nothing while i was employed there mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then because i don't want to burn any bridges i would say nothing yeah. about it and, and I always felt like this did disservice, not just to the company, but to everybody who else who, who did could easily leave. Yeah. Um, and I've kind of since changed my point of view on this. Mm -hmm. It just started, like, I always, like, for instance, before, if I'm thinking of leaving mm -hmm. a company because I'm unhappy because of mm -hmm. something, how things are going, like, I've kind of come to the decision, I always should I have say to, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say something yeah. before like yeah. I always go like, hey, listen, I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. And this is what I see going on. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I'd like to, to repair it. And if, yeah. if we can repair it, I want to stay. But if we can't repair mm -hmm. it, then let's go. And, and I think that to me feels like I've never burnt a bridge that way for the most mm -hmm. part. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. most people are, you know, either we kind of settle on, hey, this is how we work and maybe mm -hmm. this isn't a good fit for you or yeah. or um you know like or we work it out but mm -hmm. but it, it i think is meets an ethical standard that i feel oh yes yeah that, that's what you what you, you've just said is very important you felt unhappy when you, you were burning that bridge you felt unhappy that you didn't say something it's it's very important for us to feel this fairness in what we do and what and how we are treated as well. There's actually a good body of research on fairness as well, how unfairness makes us unhappy. It's very strange, right? Like, we're, we live in capitalism. Why would we be so keen to, to have fairness? But, well, we actually do. We want fairness. We, we don't want dogs uh, to be mistreated at this, on, on the streets. We don't want kids to be mistreated. We don't, we don't want us to be mistreated at work. We don't want to mistreat people. I, I would say that people are inherently good un, uh, until they're very much spoiled in some way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So, well, um, 
I, I, I want to get to one one last thing because you talked mm-hmm. about you brought up fairness. Mm-hmm. It's my last last thing in the whole free riders question. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the other lesson I've learned over my career is that is that um, culture, and I think this ethics and the oh, trust yeah. is all about culture. Yeah. Culture is a very delicate thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. like it mm-hmm. turns out that it, it, while it takes years to build properly, and I mean, it can actually destroyed. be destroyed very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, what do you do in a scenario where you feel like that that is happening often because of free riders, often maybe because mm-hmm. of change of management, whatever? Like, what would be your your mm-hmm. recommendation how to deal with that? Yeah, from from the engineering manager, I'm putting my EM hat on. Uh, from that position, I learned to dismiss let's say, free riders, when I see them. I had just two cases. In one case, eight years ago, I failed to fire the person, and the person destroyed the team. That was very, very sad, because I cared for, this te- for that team a lot. The team was destroyed. The person was toxic, and he was really proper free rider. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't helping others. He was demanding stuff. Proper free rider. I failed to fire him. That was my fail, my failure. Next time, I saw that at a consultancy gig, and we actually managed to um, show the team that that person was a free rider. And the team decided, they actually voted, they decided to let him go. And that was a very, very good team building, I would say, activity. It's, it's weird to say so, but the team saw that they were actually empowered to take decisions like that. And you know what? When the whole team saw that a person may be expelled, might be expelled from the team for being a free rider, everyone started working. Mm -hmm. And for real, working for real, not not burning out, no, but just properly, fairly working. And that was an online setting, not an office setting. So... I, I would say that managing culture in remote work is much harder than managing culture in um, the office setting. So yeah, I would say from the managerial standpoint, you need to understand if the person is free either, but be 100% that you are not mistaking this case with someone who is struggling due to some systemic issue on your team. Maybe the person is not onboarded well. Maybe something else is blocking that person. Maybe he is not or she is not treated well. I've seen once uh, that there was a gay guy who was mistreated on a team. Seriously, like, well, he wasn't doing well on the team, right? He was, no one wanted to work with him. So I actually had to have some proper discussions with the team and explain them how they were damaging not only that man life but their own d- diversity in the team and everything else so yeah as a manager you must be 100 percent that it is not a system issue but it is the person and i now well I, I now have 22 years of experience and i'm only seen two free riders and i've worked in big companies i worked in small companies i consulted a lot only two real free riders so they are quite rare but you as a manager will spot them i think and then you talk to the team And if you are a team member, I have this very good advice. If you see someone, if you think someone is a free rider, ask them for help. Ask them to help you. That will show if the person cares of the team. That will show, uh, like, if the person says no, you can always ask, may I help you? Maybe you are too busy. May I help you? So if the person rejects the, your request, you can ask uh, if you could help the person. And if the person says, well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, eh, whatever, then that person might be a free rider. And then, well, there are two ways. Either to escalate the issue, which is, I would say, an ethical way to raise a concern with a manager. Or if you are in an autonomous team, which are very rare, you can vote. I've seen only two autonomous teams where people were voting. One I actually assembled, one I just saw. That's that's good advice. Um, I especially like your idea of asking them 
for, mm -hmm. for help. That's, that's great. We got one, before we go, we got one last mm -hmm. question, one mm -hmm. question from the audience here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, they say something I ran into a leader would act nice most of the time until mm -hmm. they blew up from something insignificant while pair mm -hmm. coding. Mm -hmm. Is it important to bring up how the interaction made me feel versus ignoring it as it was their own personal issue? Oh, very, very good question. Thank you so much. I love this and I, I have this advice. I like to show my vulnerability in this situation. I like to tell the person that my motivation, my soul is hurt. I am actually hurting from what you are doing now. Could you please help me? with this could you please not do this maybe it's some rude word that i perceive in a very personal way or whatever maybe it's something else but you can also always show your vulnerability if the person is good chances are the person will just say well i'm sorry mea culpa my, my mistake you know shit happens but if the person is a bad guy or bad girl then they would laugh at you and in that case well escalate yeah yeah i had uh, i will say i've had very few fortunately mm -hmm. situations where managers actually like blew up mm -hmm. and you know um mm -hmm. but i'd i'd say i've brought that up to them like one time and they they actually blew up because i brought it up to them again mm -hmm. and i'm wow. like okay that settles it that's like mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can't, you yeah. know, this is yeah. not a, as an untenable mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, so I think it is. It, but it takes courage. It takes it does courage, take courage to actually tell the person that you are being hurt, that you are hurt. It takes courage, I must say it. But then what other choice do you have? Just leave? Well, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with that. Like the just leave is, the, is not, it mm -hmm. doesn't. It doesn't even offer the person the possibility of redemption on yeah. their part. So, like you know, you mm -hmm. I think you give them a chance to redeem themselves. Yeah. Um, and and then you make it. I mean, yeah. In my opinion, it really depends on how I like how deeply this is affecting you. If it's like, yeah. you know, but I feel like if it's really, and I'm, I'm going to guess that because they brought it up here, it's something mm -hmm. that has affected them deeply. Yeah. Then it's probably something you have to bring up because otherwise like that issue festers and you end up leaving because it's just like you know what everything else is fine but mm -hmm. i can't yeah. deal with this mm -hmm. um, it's making me feel bad so yeah like that's what motivated me to go ahead and say it's like look i mm -hmm. knew that if i didn't i couldn't continue to be yeah. yelled at the way i was being yelled at yeah. in this place and like i also um, once told my manager that my motivation is his tool it's essentially if I am motivated, he gets more results. Please don't spoil my motivation. <laughs> that wor worked <laughs> once. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully, uh, it was a DJ Viking, V King, Viking. I can't. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the name of the person who asked the question. Hopefully, that advice mm -hmm. was helpful to you. Um, all right, Vitaly, this was, I think we could go on because this is a really great topic. Um, I, I, I'm hoping we have the opportunity to, to like dive into it more yep. in the future so i really appreciate you presenting to us at night on your vacation about a topic that i think is a difficult one um to discuss so all of those things you deserve a lot of thanks for that so thank, thank you. you so much for your kind words thank you so much